the bible says we are created in god's image if it is true then we should serve the lord with gladness we should use our talents in worship and care for our children and youth we should bless our neighbors and make disciples from all nations we should share the light of jesus's love like a city set on a hill at third baptist church we support the arts we treat people like family and we see our city as beautiful welcome to third baptist church you are a treasured part of the family of god Good, good, good morning, but where is everyone? I'm, oh, oh, that's a little better. <laughs> Guess I'm a little early. I, it, I thought it was tomorrow. So, but good morning and welcome, church. We'd like to welcome everyone to worship today at Third Baptist. Um, we hope you enjoy the service and everyone at home watching online. Enjoy today's service, please, and 
enjoy the weather while you can before the weather sneaks in later today. So, so enjoy. Thank you, Mark. Did you bring enough for everybody? All right. Let us stand and pass the peace of Christ. Welcome, friends. Most glorious Lord of life, that on this day didst make thy triumph over death and sin, and having harrowed hell, didst bring away captivity, thence captive, us to win. This joyous day, dear Lord, with joy begin, and grant that we for whom thou didst die being with thy dear blood clean washed from sin may live forever in felicity. And that thy love we weighing worthily may likewise love thee for the same again and for thy sake that all like dear didst buy with love may one another entertain. So let us love, dear love, like as we ought. Love is the lesson which the Lord us taught.
Let us pray for the offering. Well, Father God, you are the giver of all good things, and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish and the loaves that were given freely for others, we pray that you would multiply these, our offerings to you, and accomplish with them more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. You, Lord, are all I have. My future is in your hands. 
how good they are. And in the night, my conscience warns me. He is near, and nothing can shake me. And I feel completely secure. I have served you faithfully. You will show me the path that leads to life and brings me pleasure forever. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. Then he appeared to James, then all apostles. After they had finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. The word of God for the people of God. Danny, I appreciate you applauding the reading there of the word. Y'all can too if you want. All right, I'm going to make a statement, and you're going to say, how can he be this brilliant? Are you ready? Here it is. You laugh too hard at that, but I'll go on. Did you know relationships between family members can get complicated. <laughs> Particularly in large families with brothers and sisters. Let's say you had a family with five brothers and at least two sisters. 
and you were poor and you lived in a fairly small stone hut with animals out in your back room. How do you think the day would go? How many stressors would happen within that family? Would there be any fights? Would there be any disagreements? Would there be any jealousy? Would the children think, Mom loves you more than she loves me? Am I just dreaming that? God sent his son to live with a family. A family of four younger brothers and at least two sisters. The brothers are named, the sisters are not. The brothers were James, Joseph, Jude, and Simeon, and at least two sisters. Not only that, but do you believe in God's providence that he chose the specific time and place for the Messiah to come? I believe that. It, it seems like common sense. So in the providence of time, the word became flesh in 6 B.C. in a Greco-Roman world in the hill country of Nazareth is where the Son of God grew up with a family. Imagine having Jesus as your older brother, seeing him walk the hills of Galilee. Did you know in Nazareth, if you've been to the Holy Land, I haven't. I've been to Texas, but I haven't been to the Holy Land. That was for you, Philip. Did you know in Nazareth, at the, the base of Nazareth is where people live, but behind is a mountain almost a thousand foot tall. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were parents to four boys and at least two sisters, how many times do you think they would go up that mountain and enjoy and play? Things really got complicated in this family when Jesus one day the older brother, the heir, decided to walk down to the River Jordan and be baptized by his cousin John and began his ministry. Remember I said before that Jesus was born in this ancient Greco-Roman culture? It's important to know because every period that an individual is born, there are certain societal norms that you have. And in Jesus' day, the one thing you did not want to bring to your family is shame. Shame cut that family in ways that you cannot imagine. When you bring shame on your family, it not only brings shame to yourself, but all your brothers, all your sisters, all your relatives. When you were growing up and you heard from your parents, what are you doing, son? You are bringing shame to this family. And shame got his attention. One day, after Jesus was beginning his ministry, he went to a synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. And he picked up a scroll and he read verses that talked about the Messiah and he rolled up the scroll and he said in his hometown, in front of his family, this day the scripture is fulfilled in me. And what did the family, particularly James, who was second in line, what did he witness? Imagine watching your older brother in a service making a statement that got the congregation so mad they ran him out of town. 
In fact, remember that Mount Precipice? They were so upset, they wanted to throw him off. Jesus came back another time into his hometown in Nazareth. And the crowds gathered around. Jesus was becoming a celebrity because all of the healing. And as the crowd gathered around, one person in the crowd went to Jesus' family and said, your son is here. And scripture says specifically that Mary and all the brothers and all the sisters came down to seize him, to restrain him. You ever known the pain of a family member? That a sibling has gone so off the rails and dealing with such a hard time, you had to gather the family together and say, we've got to go down and restrain your brother. That's what the family had to do. And they showed up in this public crowd and they heard two things. Your son is out of his mind. One of the religious leaders showed up and yelled to the crowd that was gathered. He is possessed, and it's only used here in relation to Jesus. He is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He is a demon, and he drives demons out of people. Oh, it gets better. Someone from the crowd goes up and tells Jesus, Jesus, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are here to greet you. Do you remember what Jesus said? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? Those that do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters. But my Lord, as an older, if my older brother said that in front of my mother, it's on. It's on. And you know it'd be on for you too. Later on, Jesus is sitting around with his brothers saying, I don't know, things are getting really tough. I don't know if I'll go to Passover. And the brothers essentially said, ah, oh, whether you go or not, whatever. You know, they're looking for a real Messiah. Jesus was dying on the cross. He was being executed and he looked at John and he said what John I need you to take care of my mother no mention of James or Simeon or Jude or Joseph or the sisters none of the brothers None of the sisters followed Jesus. Would you? Therefore, the scripture says, after the resurrection, he appeared to who? James. And then the disciples. Can you even imagine the intensity of that conversation. Whatever the conversation was, it transformed James because he saw in his older brother all the pieces of the puzzle were beginning to come together, which I'm sure Jesus just explained to him. And it transformed him to such an extent that James was in the upper room 
with all the other people gathered waiting for the Holy Spirit to arrive. Not only that, but James was transformed so much to the point that he went on to be the first bishop for our purposes here. I'm just going to use the word pastor. He went on to be the first pastor of the first church, the mother church of our faith. The church in Jerusalem was led by his brother James. Man, did he have a hard pastoring. He had to navigate this congregation through two high profile assassinations. One happened earlier when Stephen was stoned to death. An execution so horrific that scripture says after they saw Stephen and how he was executed that many Christians left Jerusalem. Herod Antipas, whom Jesus called a fox. Jesus never hated, but he came pretty close to the line with Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, scripture says, while James was pastor of this church, decided to lay violent hands on followers of Jesus. What does violent hands mean? That means if I was pastor of this church, I would look out at a congregation that after the benediction, there was a pretty high chance that as you walked the streets back home, someone was going to beat you up in a public man. In a way, that causes more fear than execution. Because shame is a very powerful thing. And is there anything more shameful than getting beaten up by a mob and your broken body is there on the path while you are crying? Well, Herod Antipas saw that basically his ratings went up with the people. They loved what he did. So the next thing he did is that he decided to execute James, the brother of the disciple John. James, the disciple, the inner circle of Peter, John, and James. Scripture says that he was executed by the sword, run through with a sword. Not only that, but our dear brother James got a nickname. James the Just. He got the nickname James the Just because he was wise. And when there was a problem to solve with the birth of our Christian faith, where did they go? To the mother church, to the church of Jerusalem, led by James and friends and we're about to turn if you're a follower of Jesus this counsel affects you to this day and it was led by James this was a meeting this was a council of such importance that if James did not navigate it correctly and with wisdom the chances of Christianity dying in the first two centuries were really, really high. So what I want you to do is turn to Acts chapter 15. If you're not familiar with scripture in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, All right, I'll give you a little introduction and then I want you, we'll, we'll go to James's 
decision. Here was the problem. And folks, it may not seem like much to you, but this was huge. While James was pastor, Paul and Barnabas were converting Gentiles. And Mike, let's say that you were a Gentile. And after you wore those glasses, I think people would come to that conclusion. But let's say you were a Gentile. And you are, you agree to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you ask, well, this is a Jewish religion. It, it comes, the birth is from Judaism. Do I need to follow the law? Do I need to get circumcised? And Paul would say, no, you don't. And this really upset, understandably, those Christians that were Jewish, particularly Pharisees who were followers of Christ, which would say they need to follow the law. Our text is the Hebrew Bible. It is the Old Testament. So part of salvation, Mike, is that you not only have to profess faith, but you need to follow Jewish laws and traditions. You need to get circumcised. You need to go to the festivals and we'll welcome you here into the synagogue. Those are two polar opposites. And so you see there are arguments back and forth. I'm gonna shorten it up to save time. There are arguments back and forth, but there is a fascinating passage in Acts 15. After everyone has said their comments, James speaks. If you ever want to see the power person in a room in a heated, important meeting, wait for the last person that's going to speak, and it's usually in a calm manner. And that was James. James essentially said, I've heard all the arguments. This is what we're going to do. This is my decision. And he said this in front of Paul. Here it is. Acts 15. Verse 19. Acts 15, verse 19. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogue. Don't have time to go into the weeds, but essentially what James did is that he reached a compromise. A compromise that the church would still debate, but James was not so dogmatic that he went to the far right or to the far left. He thought we can go down this middle way and keep the gospel alive. Is that a word for today's culture? James willfully gave up, friends, thousands of years of Jewish tradition for the love of the gospel. Have you ever tried a tradition in a church? Maybe changing the times of the services or changing the carpet or changing the times of Sunday school or this, that, and the other. What if we had a tradition going back 170 years and I got up and said, well, we're going to change that next Sunday. Well, I, you'd be calling your neck faster. But Brother James, thousands of years said this is the way. 
Well, James was eventually executed. The earliest recordings of this was from Josephus, the high priest Annas, took advantage of a power vacuum and came to James and essentially said, if you don't recant, we're going to kill you. We're going to stone you. James was not a disciple or a follower of Jesus. James, during his older brother's ministry, went to restrain him. James heard from religious leaders that his older brother was filled with Satan. James experienced public shame growing up. How many times did he have to hear, what is wrong with your family? But James endured because he was confronted with what he thought was Jesus of Nazareth. But when he was confronted with the risen Lord, he was confronted with Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. I have seen him. He is risen. I, you're going to have to kill me. Did you know all James had to do was just say, I just, just <laughs> enough. I'm going to leave this city and get back to my nice, safe country town up north in Galilee. You can have all of this. you have done that? I'd have considered it. But he saw the risen Lord. Do you remember Cleopas from last Sunday? Cleopas was at Emmaus and he saw the risen Lord. Imagine James facilitating communion at this Jerusalem church and out in the congregation was Cleopas. And James takes a piece of bread and he takes it and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it. Pay attention to Cleopas out in that congregation. I can see that dear brother closing his eyes and just remembering while he sees James facilitate communion. I remember that time that I saw him. I saw him. He is risen. There is always hope. Cleopas wasn't around when four years later, Two years later, after James was executed, the Jewish civil war broke out. And then four years after that, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed in the most horrific manner imaginable. Thousands were killed. Others were exiled to slavery in Rome. A few made it out. Friends, you, if, if you doubt the miracle of the church in these 60s, the first 60s of A.D., our faith was dead in the water. Peter was gone. Peter was executed. James was executed. Paul was executed. Jerusalem was in rubble. The temple was gone. The first church was gone. Who is going to stand in the gap? There is no hope. We have no army. We have no political pull. But the Jerusalem church survived in exile. For the second pastor of the Jerusalem church served from 63 A.D. to 117 
A-D. That's north of Oscar Johnson years. <laughs> and this dear brother navigated this church and he gained a reputation throughout Palestine of one of honor and a great leader for the church. Who was it? Simeon. Simeon. The son of Cleopas. So can you imagine Simeon taking a piece of bread, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it, and thinking in his mind how often he heard the story of Emmaus from his father. How often he heard the story of his mother, Mary of Cleopas, which scripture says she was at the foot of the cross and saw Jesus suffer and die. And how often did he think of James executed? How often did he think of the dear brothers and sisters at this Jerusalem church that had gone through horror unimaginable. And imagine Simeon, son of Cleopas, saying to his church, you can endure, you can survive, there is always hope no matter what you're going through in your life because the one thing we have all in common is that we do not serve a myth but a risen Lord that walks with you each day and if they kill us then it's better to be with the Lord friends that wasn't rhetoric that was based on history and relationships and in the big story of God the first 300 years of our faith was built not through political manipulations, not through the sword, but for the, from the witness of Jesus Christ preaching that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus rose from the dead, and confess with your mouth, Jesus will forgive you of your sins. You are saved. We'll conclude with the image on the front of the worship guide. It is an artist's interpretation when they were growing up together of the older Jesus with his son with his arms around his brother James walking arm in arm. That's how James got through. That's how Simeon got through. That is how you will endure. Walking arm in arm, sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him that there is always hope that the last thing that will happen to you is never the worst thing because of the resurrection. Now, friends, I hate it when preachers do that, say it's the last thing I'm going to say. And I'm, I'm sitting there, land the plane, dummy. All right, I promise this will land the plane. <laughs> you have a treasure beyond measure in your Bible. I want you to read it tonight. We have a letter from James. And James says at the first of the letter, it's very powerful when you know the story. Count it all joy when you suffer. Count it all joy because you will endure. And then he lays out specifically 
in almost a Sermon on the Mount way how we are to live and to treat and to love one another. Well, beloved, you come from a great heritage. And thanks be to God for James, Jesus' brother. Thanks be to God for Simeon and all of those great saints that built these wonderful, planted these wonderful trees from which we can enjoy the shade this day in 2024. And all God's people said with joy, Dear ones, let's stand and sing this beautiful hymn of invitation and benediction. I invite those who are interested in joining our congregation to please come forward, and I'll be honored to introduce you to everyone. Uh, if you would like to know more about following Jesus, I invite you to contact us. All right, let's stand and sing together. if you'd be seated just for a moment. All right, Gloria. Not yet. You're ahead. We had somebody join this morning. We've got to get right there. Harrison, you're banned from this congregation. Get out of here. Harrison, Harrison, I tell you, have a seat. I'm going to ban my husband. <laughs> Man, if, I, if we had communion today, I would say there was something in the grape juice, but Go ahead. Before I knew who this young man was, I was so impressed because he stood in the gap at a very crucial time for one of our families. He, he didn't know them. And somebody couldn't sing or do that. You know how it is, get somebody at the last minute. So we go down the list and we get to him and it's like, yeah, I'll be glad to do it. Well, it's kind of complicated. Oh, okay, I'll work on it. Oh, thank God for this guy. And then has he has continued to come to our, our church family and connected with us on so many ways. He is coming this morning to join our church family. So I want to introduce you to Stephen Schermitzler. I said it right. All right, let's welcome Stephen. Come on. Gloria, he said we, he can sing too. That's yeah, right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it was good. Stephen, we are thankful you are part of us. We are thankful for the ministry of our choir to where you were able to come and connect with this dear church family. You have already made yourself home, but you come and you relax and you be who you are and let us minister to you and you find your gifts and then minister to us like you already have. So let's thank this dear brother again and welcome him. Now, after the service, uh, you're invited to come and shake hands with Stephen, and then we have uh, refreshments in Pillsbury Threshold. So have a seat, 
And Gloria, while you go up, <laughs> you need help. No, I have help. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm just going to sit down now. <laughs> Blessings on you. Bring the benediction, and after the benediction, let's remain for the beauty of the post. First of all, Pastor, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. And let's thank God for our pastor, his wife. Thank God for just everything. I had to put that in there. And now the benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that today, together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Have a happy and healthy week. And remember, 